Welcome everybody um, at this early hour and thanks so much for joining. We have a, I think a really interesting um, and very uh, well-educated group of panelists on what's been happening in the Middle East over the, over the past few months and what it means for the region, what it means for business, what it means for security cooperation. And we'll also um, look at how um, the Biden administration um, might look at both the, the recent rapprochement between Israel and, and a number of Arab states and in Iran and how, how to move forward with the region. Um, I'm Jay Solomon, I'm a senior director at, at APCO um, and also an adjunct fellow uh, at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy where I still write quite a bit about the Middle East. And I'll start off by saying APCO is very excited about what's been happening as I think we're the, the only uh, public relations company that's been both in Israel and in and in the UAE for the past uh, 15 years. So we see this as a really exciting time and an opportunity. Um, just a little background to, to start off. Um, I mean, the summer really saw a seismic shift in the politics of the Middle East uh, with Israel normalizing relations with four Arab states, uh, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Sudan, and Morocco as part of a US brokered diplomatic process known as the Abraham Accords. Uh, the agreements are breathing, breathing hopes that more Arab and Islamic countries will establish ties with Israel, uh, further integrating the country into the Middle East, which has been a kind of a major US foreign policy objective for the past seven decades. We're already seeing some pretty amazing images of Israeli tourists, trade delegations, and products showing up in Bahrain and Dubai and there's much greater hopes for cooperation in medicine, clean energy, irrigation, oil and gas development, uh, and also kind of what's been happening more in the shadows coming more public as far as security cooperation between Israel and the Gulf states. Um, there were reports just in recent weeks, months of, of Prime Minister Netanyahu going to Iraq, Riyadh to meet Prime Minister uh, Mohammed bin Salman but also, as I was saying earlier, with the, with the Biden administration taking office in just days, there are questions about the future of the Abraham Accords and, and what the Biden administration's view towards the Middle East will be. Some senior Democratic lawmakers uh, who will soon control both the House and the Senate have questioned some of the terms of the agreement and the, Obama, and the Biden administration has pledged to rejoin the Iran nuclear agreement, which could rekindle some tensions between Washington and this emerging block of Israel and the Gulf states. Um, we have a really great panel here today. First of all, we have Ambassador Yusuf al Otaiba of the UAE. He, serves, he has served as the ambassador to Washington since 2008. And prior to that was the director of international affairs for Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed. He has really been a center player in the Abraham Accords. His op-ed in the in Hebrew language uh, newspaper, Yidia, our note last June was really critical to jumpstarting um, the process that led to these Abraham Accords. We also have Ambassador Ido Alroni. He serves as a global distinguished professor at New York University's Program for International Relations and is a 25 year veteran of Israel's Foreign Service. He was Council General in New York for a record six years and has been central uh, in marketing Israel as a business and tourism destination and was the founder of the Brand Israel program. We also have Frank Lowenstein, who's an executive director at APCO Worldwide in Washington, where he works on a range of international issues. During the second term of the Obama administration, he was the State Department's special envoy for the Middle East peace process and was a senior advisor to Secretary of State John Kerry. And we have Elizabeth Cohen. Elizabeth is a senior director at, Washington, at APCO's Washington's offices working out of the executive chairman's office. And prior to joining APCO, she served for six years in the US government, both as a director on the National Security Council and a senior advisor at the US Agency for International Development. Um, I'd like to start off and, and bring Ambassador Otaiba and Elizabeth in and just talk from, particularly from the ambassador's view, how did these Abraham Accords come about and what do they say about the changing Middle East? Uh, you want me to start? Yeah, please. That'd be great. Sure. So the first, and I think probably the most important message I would want our audience to hear is Middle East is changing. 
Uh, I was talking to a friend the other day and I made this point and he responded by saying, no, no, the Middle East has actually already changed. I said, yeah, but it's still further changing. It's not done changing. And I think a lot of the old paradigms, a lot of the old preconceived notions about the Palestinian issue, about the way the Middle East is viewed, about sectarianism, it's changing. It's changing. There is data to prove it. Every time I go home and I talk to people, I hear completely different attitudes. I think people are tired of conflict. People are tired of ideology. People want the same thing people want here. They want opportunities. They want careers. They want to travel. They want to invest. They want to start families. And, and I think the conflicts that we have kind of been pre-programmed for are, are not as big as they used to be. And the best way to kind of understand that is just look how widely accepted and celebrated the Abraham Accords were in 2020, given how, um, let's say, the peace accords of Egypt in 1979 or even the Jordan peace accord with Israel in 1993 were. Uh, you know, there's just, the attitudes are very different today than they were. But the short answer to your question is how did they come about? They really came about today because of annexation. You know, if we wanted to normalize with Israel, we weren't going to be able to do it after annexation, which is exactly what triggered that op-ed in mid-June, because I don't think Israelis had heard that message. On one hand, we hear we want stronger relationships with our Arab partners. We want to work together on, you know, shared threats and shared uh, interests, but we also want to annex. And I was trying to explain that you can't have both. If you take disputed lands, or if you annex disputed lands, you won't be able to improve your relationship with Arab countries. And if you want to improve your relationship with Arab countries, you won't be able to annex disputed land. So you have a choice to make. It's your choice. It's a sovereign country, but you, you cannot think that both will be able to function normally. And that was kind of the, the key theme of the op-ed. I think it triggered a debate, which was exactly what we were hoping for. And that debate ultimately ended up with a, a very successful Abraham Accords. Was there much, um, was that editorial you wrote, was it a controversial thing inside the UAE government or was it something that was pretty easy to go forward on? It was the, it was the government who encouraged me to do it. So I, I can be, you know, I can be relatively annoying when I have to be sometimes. Oh. No. I was, <laughs> I was pestering my leadership. I was like, guys, you have to send this message. The Israelis cannot think that they can annex and then, you know, increase their cooperation. It's going to be really tough to host Expo after annexation, uh, an, an Israeli pavilion at Expo after annexation. And so after about two or three weeks of me pestering people, they finally came back to me and said, you do it. I said, do what? They said, you write an article and place it in Israeli press. I said, are you sure? They said, yep. This is your idea. You're the you know one who thinks this is important. Go ahead and do it. So no, I got I had total backing. You know, we reviewed the draft together, and uh, you know, here, here, this is how we started getting here. Elizabeth, I know you're you're in touch with the with the Kushner team. How how did the Trump administration view um, the Abraham Accords and this move? Given that it is sort of a, a different tact, a different view of how to bring about uh, stability in the Middle East. Normally it's, you know, the Palestinian question needs to be resolved first, but what, what, what have you picked up from, from the Kushner yeah, team on um, all this? Thanks, Jay. Um, and, and thanks, Ambassador, for, for your perspective. I, uh, I see the Abraham Accords as uh, an outgrowth of a couple of steps that preceded from the White House that didn't go that well in 20s in my in my opinion uh in 2017 2018 um the emphasis was really heavily on developing an economic development package um for the region but with obviously a, a very big focus on palestinian territories and really using that uh to incentivize some uh, negotiation and and uh yeah, to incentivize negotiation. And um, a lot of effort um, and work with uh, international financial institutions and with Gulf countries to sort of pull together a really big package. Um, that, that was the primary focus. And 
they, I think it just um, fell flat. And I think that wasn't surprising to a number of people that an economic package was not gonna be the path uh, to some compromise, uh, that this couldn't be sort of bought, so to speak. And uh, the political step came, was happening sort of in parallel, but frankly, much more discreetly. So those of us at NSC were involved in some of the economic work, um, but really less so the political work and um, when those two steps, the, the economic package and then the, um, the political plan um, fell flat, I think the third phase became uh, working on the Abraham Accords. And I think it, it follows the, the thread, I think, for the White House has been working with Gulf countries, working regionally around sort of the margins to try to get at they would say to try to get at a you know a, a compromise and a solution um, for the Palestinian territories and and you know whether or not you agree with that that's for everyone to decide. Um, so so I do think this approach is is an out um, the Abraham Accords are an outgrowth of that approach. Um, I think that the idea that normalized relations could help. Um, bring some added pressure possibly to Iran in the future is certainly part of the goal. Um, I think that uh, boosting economic ties regionally, again, tying back to their sort of first approach, which was this robust economic package. Um, I think that's also part of, part of the goal there, um, that if they can see increased trade. And Jay, you mentioned, you know, even water irrigation and um, some other sectors that that really hold promise. I think for regional normalization and integration, um, they really think again that that working at that regional level for, um, with integration could really help add to um, a compromise. So, um, so from the White House perspective, that's how I saw the Abraham Accords arise. I can tell you, you know that. They're really excited about it. They think that they are, um, that the dominoes started to fall and um, they're, they're quite pleased with how far they got. And of course, disappointed that um, there's not four more years of runway. Um, and, uh, and they do think that, um, that there is some confusion or misunderstanding in the public about sort of what these accords are and what they accomplish. Um, they think that the political plan was really dismissed out of hand just simply because it was coming from, um, from the Trump administration. Um, and so they got sort of pushed to this other, this other perspective, this other approach. Um, and they also feel like they, they've gotten a lot of criticism that these, these Abraham Accords are like drug deals, you know, um, with sort of nefarious um, and massive in incentives um, mixed in um, to which they might say that um, you know the drug deals were really the the deals with you know Jordan and so on in the 70s, and that these are really quite tame by comparison. But uh, anyway, I'll, I'll I'll stop there. That's that um, I think is is how I would um, present the, the White House perspective on how, on how the Abraham Accords came about. Great, thanks, Ambassador Oteba. Could you give us a sense from the UA just how? much economic integration or dynamism has, has started to flow as a result. I mean, we've seen a lot of, I've seen a lot of images of, you know, Israeli produce in, in, in Dubai or Emirati trade delegations coming to Israel. Could, could you give us a sense of, of what it feels like so far? And then, Ido, you know, I'd like to hear it from Israel after, after, the, after the ambassador's comments. Yeah, so I don't have numbers. Numbers are harder to measure right now, especially with you know multiple lockdowns going on and off in, in Israel and sometimes in UAE. So I don't have data. We haven't traded X amount of dollars, but I can tell you anecdotally that what I see is really excited young Emiratis who are traveling to Israel in Arab clothes. Like they are going there in their traditional Arab clothes, taking selfies at the airport and sending them to me, right? So there's excitement from the UAE side heading towards Israel. We've just unlocked a country to them that, you know, for the entire lives they told they were not able to go to. Now they can go visit, they can be tourists, they can be investors, they can be startups. So for young people, we've we've basically opened up this thing that they were that was a taboo for them. For the business community, and we have a very strong business community between Abu Dhabi and Dubai, 
we've just unlocked one of the most powerful economies for them. It's one of the biggest markets. So we have a lot of Emirati businessmen who want to invest or trade with Israel. And I'm sure Ido can speak to this. There's a, <laughs> there's even more excitement from Israeli businesses and techs and startups coming to the UAE. So you have these two very dynamic, very fast moving, very forward looking economies who until recently really weren't able to speak to each other. They've just been kind of swimming in separate lanes. All of a sudden they can work together. So I, I think this will unleash a lot of economic potential. This will create jobs. This will create uh, tech startups and investment flows. So on, on the economic side, it is probably the, I would say the strongest part of this entire agreement is what will be unleashed economically. But the part I'm most excited about, and, and I'm because <laughs> I'm not a businessman, is just the, the gradual level of increased understanding between the two countries and societies and cultures and people. When a young Emirati feels like it's okay to work or talk to an Israeli and an Israeli says, hey, wait, maybe, <laughs> maybe all Arabs don't actually hate us, which is what I understand they, they grow up believing. So this human to human level that's going to increase understanding to me is what's most exciting about this. You know, I, you know, I know you spent a long time building the Israeli brand and, and, and trying to bring in investment. How do you, how do you see this? Well, I think that, um, you know, I agree with everything the ambassador said. Um, you know, the key word really is, is creativity. The world is now looking at human creativity as the most important asset. And um, that's the main reason why the United States is still the number one producer of knowledge and innovation in the world because of the fact that it is able to nurture and facilitate creativity. And uh, we see um, a, a great, um, you know, compatibility of self-interests between Israel and the GCC countries. We have to remember the background. Um, and, and again, the ambassador was correct to use the term unlock it's an unlocking of energy. Israelis feel, felt besieged uh, because uh, simply there was a, a boycott, a real boycott since 1945 to those our friends in, uh, in the world that wondered why Israel had to sign peace agreements with countries it never had war with. The answer is the Arab economic boycott of 1945 that was never officially lifted. And, um, and so the Israelis are extremely enthusiastic. I looked at the list of participants today and I noticed there are several key Israeli officials in the Export Institute and so on participating in today's call, which is a great, again, great indication as to the level of excitement. Basically, we are looking at um, a relationship we will develop standing on three legs. The first is obviously the security slash geopolitical self-interest. Again, compatibility here is, um, is striking, uh, not only because of the Iran issue, but because of the, um, uh, the need to develop regional alliances. The second leg obviously is to develop the economic ties, develop the economic strength through trade. It's already happening. As the ambassador said, groups are um, flying back and forth. I can tell you the Israelis are looking at the, the Gulf region is if you know they're, they're they're flying there to to discover uh, you know the Israeli media calls it the Israeli gold rush uh, to the Gulf region and uh, Israelis are very very happy about um, about doing business in the Gulf and so on and then of course the third leg which in my view is perhaps the most important leg because at the end of the day that's what matters is what I call the soft power leg. It's the, um, the, uh, the soft issues such as uh, developing uh, environmental solutions or even cultural dialogue. Um, I know that there's already a great deal of academic exchange going on between universities in the Gulf and, um, and universities in Israel. And not to mention the fact that uh, perhaps the most uh, difficult sporting club in Israel from a cultural point of view is now 50% owned by a family from the UAE. And that's a, a, a great sign of the power of soft power. Great. Are there any sectors in particular, Ambassador Teba, you know, that you think are, are the most exciting? I know there's a lot of interest in particular in joint energy development in the Mediterranean, making kind of that region energy uh, independent 
from your view, what what is that? Is that the key sector? Are there others of the economy that are really getting a lot of attraction? I think the areas that we want to really focus on, and I think where Israel obviously has distinct advantages, technology in all of its forms. So just technology, whether it's you know cyber, AI, smart cities, you name it. Uh, I think we're very interested in life sciences. It's something we feel that we can make a lot of improvement in and be a hub for, whether it's biotech, pharmaceuticals, uh, healthcare. And then the one we really ob obviously is key to us is agritech and water. You know, we are incredibly dependent on importing all of our 85% uh, of our food supplies. And we want to increase our ability to be self-sufficient that requires us to be far better at agriculture and watering and irrigation techniques. And these are all things that Israel excels in. So to me, initially, those are the top three sectors that I think we're going to be really focused on. What do you think, Ida? I would add to that, and I, of course, agree. Um, we noticed that in, in one area, at least the fintech, um, the, the Gulf countries, especially UAE, is more advanced. Uh, than most uh, Western countries, um, where what Israel can bring to the table that is relevant to the realities uh, on the ground in the Gulf region is, of course, food tech, healthcare in the first place, um, uh, the transition to predictive medicine, preventive medicine, and remote healthcare, and obviously cybersecurity. It's already happening. Cybersecurity was the main reason for under the radar relations over the years that started decades ago between Israel and, and the Gulf countries, including, by the way, uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, and how about on the security front, Ambassador, how overt or not just on security, but diplomatically, how overt do you think cooperation between the UAE, the GCC and Israel will be going forward? Because there really is a lot of shared interests, shared views on whether it's a threat from Iran, um, the threat from terrorism, the cyber issue. Where do you yeah. see that going? It's, I mean, so that started happening before the Abraham Accords. It will continue happening after the Abraham Accords. But because, because of its nature, it will not be over, right? We do not advertise when we have meetings and cooperations and joint ops with the CIA, right? That's, these are very sensitive discussions. And so it will continue, it will get stronger, but it will happen you know, behind the curtains as it normally does. So I don't think you're gonna see any new sort of public sort of uh, military exercises. That's just, it's not how we operate. But I think you'll see quiet cooperation because that's how we do it with all the countries, not just Israel. Great. Um, I wanna bring in Frank, Frank Lowenstein now. Um, the president-elect of Biden actually has been pretty Overtly, he was he was complimentary of the of the Abraham Accords. He said that publicly, um, but there still is a, a question of how um, the Biden administration is going to approach this momentum that's been building. Will they seek to build on it? There have been some democratic democratic lawmakers who've said they want to challenge some of the terms of the Abraham Accords, whether it was F thirty five sales to the UAE or arms sales to Bahrain or the or, uh, aid package for Sudan. So I'd just love to get your sense on how you think the Biden administration will approach the Abraham Accords, uh, the issue of Middle East peace when they come in. Yeah, well, thanks very much, Jay. So first of all, I think the, the uh, senior members of the incoming Biden administration have been very clear uh, that they viewed the Abraham Accords as a historic achievement. I think they probably focused a little bit more credit on, on Ambassador Taiba and the Crown Prince and the Emiratis and the, the Trump administration for, for understandable reasons. Uh, but in any event, they, they, they've been very clear and very public about that. We support the Abraham Accords, we support that process, and I imagine it will continue. I think that if there is one difference between the way they approach this problem and the way uh, the Trump administration approached the problem, and again, th they're still working out a lot of the details of, of, of what they're gonna do when they, when they take office in a week. Uh, so I don't think there's been any definitive conclusions, but if I was back doing my, my old job, uh, I would imagine the conversations would revolve around <clears throat> how can we use the next stage of the Abraham Accords to advance reconciliation or resolution to some degree in any event with the Palestinians. So I, I would be sort of surprised just personally if the Biden administration was trading off things like recognition of Western Sahara 
or, or um, uh, taking Sudan off the state sponsor list in order to achieve that goal. But I can very easily see them taking a look at the equation with respect to the Israelis and the Palestinians and say, how can we use this new regional dynamic to advance uh, the cause of peace there? I think that remains a, a priority. Obviously, uh, President Biden, President-elect Biden has been very clear that he still supports the two-state solution. We still want uh, to implement policies that will that will further that goal. And I think the one question that, that, that we would have had about uh, uh, the outside-in approach, which is what Prime Minister Netanyahu has been talking about for many years, including when we were there, was how exactly does that translate into progress on the Palestinian file? And I think Ambassador Otay has been very uh, thoughtful on this subject. We, the world can't wait, the region can't wait for the Palestinians, right? That, that, that can't be the approach any longer. But at the same time, it does remain a problem uh, 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 that, that needs to be resolved. So I think as we look at the Abraham Accords process going forward, there may be an eye towards how can we use that? How can we actually further the, 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 the objective of the outside in approach, which was to help advance the cause of peace over there. And can I just add to that? We got accused a lot about, you know, we're being, uh, we were selling out the Palestinians and we were betraying the Palestinian cause and so on. And I don't know if you've observed, but the Sudan deal, the Morocco deal, and the Bahrain deal got absolutely nothing for the Palestinians. Nothing. There was nothing, there were no concessions for the Palestinian state or people in any of those three agreements. While at least in ours, we suspended and you know stopped essentially annexation because now Biden is going to be the new, new president. So I think it's important for people to understand that not only do we support the two-state solution, we believe the two-state solution is the only game in town. This doesn't get resolved any other way. But it was going to be, there was going to be no two-state solution if annex annexation proceeded. Like we saved the two-state solution, and yet we got accused of being, you know, sellouts. And I was very disappointed in the Palestinian reaction to that. I mean, do you see a way? Yeah, I think it's a really important in? point. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Frank. No, I was just going to say uh, 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 it's an excellent example of exactly the, the principle I'm pointing out. When the Emiratis did recognition, uh, they did so in a manner that 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 really advanced the cause of it two-state solution. These other deals, Bahrain and Morocco and Sudan, a little harder to see uh, uh, the nexus there between uh, a normalization and, and, and resolution of the Palestinian issue. So I think the Emiratis are really a model uh, of how that process can work uh, going forward from the Biden administration's perspective. Do you get a sense, Frank, how big a priority this will be under President Obama? I mean, when he took office in 2009, he really went straight into the Arab visibility issue as, as a major you know, frontline issue. Do you get a sense that this will be the case with the Biden administration or there's just so much other stuff going on? They'll, they'll definitely want to pursue it, but it's not going to be kind of a front, front burner issue, at least at the beginning. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I, I don't think it's a big priority uh, for these guys. I think they've got a lot of other issues they're focused on. I think uh, the president's been very clear the first hundred days will be focused on the pandemic and, and economic relief. I think they've got big issues to resolve with respect to what our China policy is gonna be, how we're gonna handle Russia, how we're gonna handle any number of different pressing issues. And I think right now, if you if you look at the people that are in charge there, Tony Blinken and Jake Sullivan and John Piner and that gang, um, you know, we, we've all worked on this issue for for a decade now. And I think that there's a, there's a real sense that, um, you know, unless something changes with respect to the Palestinian attitude about it or the perhaps the Israeli attitude about it, that there's not a lot of opportunity to make a lot of progress right now. So I think that they're, they're going to prioritize the issues which I think are, are paramount in terms of US national security interests and, uh, and ones where we think we can make some progress. And so right now I, I, I don't see it as being a priority for these because I don't think they've sorted out exactly what the plan's gonna be. I think they wanna start uh, uh, with some, um, a return to some degree of, of, of of, of a relationship with the Palestinians that the, the Trump administration sort of shut down. And I think they'll try to take some steps or, or early on in that regard. But I think it's very notable that there's no uh, a special envoy for, for Israeli-Palestinian negotiations uh, uh, thus far under the Biden administration. I think that sends a signal uh, that this is not an issue that they're gonna put a lot of priority on. Now, I don't think they're gonna name a lot of envoys and that can always change. But I think right now I would not, I would not describe this as a high priority inside of the Biden administration. You know, how, in, how is Israel looking right now, both at the Middle East peace process, but also with the Biden administration coming in. Uh, Netanyahu did not have the best relationship with the Obama administration, that wasn't a secret, but I'm curious from your, your perspective, how, how Israel is both looking at the Palestinian issue with this new momentum in the Abraham Accords and the 
the arrival of the Biden administration. So first we have to talk about the upcoming Israeli elections. Uh, the fourth national elections in less than two years. This time is different um, because Netanyahu is being challenged from his right wing. First time. Also, we should remember that in the past three rounds, although he is, he is serving as a prime minister, he was unable to form a narrow right wing coalition, which is led by Likud. Uh, and there's, uh, you will not find too many commentators in Israel today that will um, um, project that he will be able to do it the fourth time. So uh, there are pretty good chances. I can't tell you exactly, you know, <laughs> you know, in percentage, but pretty good chances that um, in March, Netanyahu will be replaced. Uh, the leading candidate to replace him at this point, when you look at the Israeli political system, is uh, his main contender from the right wing. That's the first thing that should be said. The second is uh, Joe Biden comes to the White House with an unprecedented degree of um, experience and intimacy with Israel. Um, and there is, I, I don't think that there was a president that had so much previous experience with Israel coming into the White House. Um, and so um, I anticipate that whoever is going to be the prime minister, whether it's going to be Netanyahu or someone else, uh, the relationship with the, with the Biden administration on the personal level will be very, very open, very transparent, not to mention the fact that again, when you consider that the China is hovering, the whole discussion between you know U.S.-China ties is hovering above the whole discussion between Israel and 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 the Gulf countries. Um, not to mention the fact that everything that Israel will do, security-wise, economically, will be in coordination and full coordination with the with the administration. So we have to keep those things in mind. And again, I'm not sure that going into April 2021. Uh, that Netanyahu will still be Israel's prime minister. It, more and more, it looks like he will not be. Uh, Ambassador Teba, if, if Netanyahu exits the scene, how do you think that will impact um, what's been happening, whether it's the Abraham Accords, whether it's Middle East peace, whether it's security cooperation? I can think in some ways, if he's gone, it might be easier to sort of kickstart um, some of the Middle East peace process. But how do you think his exit could could change the calculations? So the truth is, I don't know, because I don't know who's going to replace him and what kind of policies they're going to bring. But Jay, even if I did, I'm not going to try to answer a question about Israeli politics in, <laughs> in a run up to an election. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, the other big issue coming in will be Iran and what um, position the, the Biden administration takes towards Iran. He's talked, uh, both President-elect Biden and some of his top aides like Jake Sullivan have talked about joining the Iran deal. Frank, maybe you could just give us a little background on what you're hearing as far as what they what they might do and, and, how, and then we could broaden the conversation. Sure, yeah, well, I would just point you to the public comments that, that the President-elect has made and that Jake has made, uh, uh, that they wanna, they wanna rejoin the JCPOA, they wanna put Iran uh, back in the box, uh, as Jake described it. And I think the, the, the thing to bear in mind here is that whether you like that deal or don't like that deal, and I think there's reasonable arguments uh, on, in, in many different quarters around that issue. I, I, I think it is the case now that we have a pressing problem, which is that Iran has begun enriching to 20%. They have 2,600 kilograms of LEU. Uh, uh, they've, they've installed advanced centrifuges and, and they're threatening to kick the uh, IE inspectors out in February. So I, I don't know that that um, we have any choice really other than to sit down with the Iranians and to try to figure out uh, how we can how we can push off uh, uh, some of the advancements they've made, how we can increase the amount of breakout time they have. Because as of right now, I think we're heading towards a mess uh, in relatively short order. And I don't know, I'd be interested to hear what, what uh, the ambassadors have to say, uh, but what would be the alternative and I know there's a lot of, 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 of tricky questions with respect to when sanctions are removed uh, uh, and, and when Iran comes back into full compliance with JCPOA, if that's indeed uh, uh, the approach they take. Dennis Ross and others have, have had suggestions about sort of interim agreements or smaller level agreements. But, and I know that the view of many in the, in the Gulf and in Israel is that we ought to 
uh, remove, extend, if not remove, all the sunset provisions and deal with missiles and some of Iran's other malign, uh, um, you know, endeavors in the region. And the question, I, I guess, is just, all right, how are we going to get all of that stuff resolved when Iran is, is working aggressively, uh, I think, to, to increase the leverage they have? And, and what's the plan if, if we're not going to, to enter back into the JCPOA? What are we going to do in February when they kick the inspectors out? Is that a, is that a military proposition or just increase the sanctions? Or, uh, so look, I don't think they have a, 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 a anything other than the strongest desire in the world to prevent Iran from developing a nuclear weapon. So I think the question is just what's the best way to get from here to there, uh, given that we're going to have a fairly pressing issue. And by the way, that's when the JCPOA started was when Iran was marching towards uh, building a nuclear weapon. And we, we managed to put that whole process in uh, uh, very much on hold while we were in the deal. And, and I think for about a year after we pulled out of the deal, the, the Iranians remained uh, sort of more or less in compliance with it. And so we, we, we addressed the pressing threat of Iran's nuclear program then. And, and now we, we're going to have to figure out how to do it you know, as we go forward now. So I'd just be curious to hear what uh, what the alternative is to turning to JCPOA or some version of it, uh, uh, given, the, given the imminence of the problems we're gonna have with these guys. Yeah, Ambassador Taita, what's the view from Abu Dhabi? There's reports today that Iranians say they're gonna start producing uranium metal, which is essentially a, a core piece of an atomic bomb. And they definitely seem to be trying to ratchet up the pressure from the on the nuclear front as the Biden administration comes in, but what what is what is your government's view now as far as what to do with Iran after this four years of maximum financial pressure? Yeah, so so let me be clear because I think our views or our position obviously gets um, misconstrued a lot uh, depending on you know who you're talking to. I, I want to be very clear. I think we definitely want a deal. The UAE definitely wants a deal that brings stability and some, some kind of long-term uh, de-escalation for us in the region. So that's not, that's not a, that's, there's nothing confusing about that. Question is, what does that deal look like? I think we are perfectly positioned to get a much better deal than JCPOA 1.0. I think JCPOA 1.0 was a good start it did what it was designed to do, which was just put, basically put a pause for a certain amount of time. But I think it should have gone further. I think we should address all the other shortcomings like missiles, like proxies, like interference. Why should they have sunset clauses if we have a perfectly operational nuclear program that doesn't have enrichment? So these are things we believe I think should be incorporated. And you are perfectly positioned to have that conversation today because of the maximum pressure because of the situation with COVID, and because of low oil prices. So Iran is under a lot of pressure. The question I think we have to ask ourselves, whether you're negotiating with Iran, whether you're negotiating with North Korea, or whether you're buying a car, is who wants to deal more? Is, is the P5 plus one the ones who desperately need a deal? Or is it Iran that desperately needs sanctions relief? And I think answering that question properly then sets the stage for the negotiations. The other point I'd like to make, and, and I've said this privately, is why are nobody, why is no one from the region included? Why are we not at the table in the negotiations that determine the fate of the region? I mean, it would be the equivalent of going to the, um, to go have negotiations with, the, with North Koreans, but excluding Japan, China, and South Korea. And I think whether it was Abraham Accords driven or not, the fact is all of America's partners, Israel, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain, even Jordan and Egypt are aligned when it comes to the Iranian issue. They're all aligned. So when you ignore your entire regional block of partners in, the, in that part of the world, it'd be like going to make a deal with North Korea that China, Japan and South Korea are against. So I, we want a deal. We think we are position to get a much better deal than the first one. And I think we should be at the table. Yeah, I'll just put it in there. Sorry, go ahead, sorry, Frank. Just really quickly, that, that, that what, what Jake has said publicly is that JCPOA is step one, and that will lay the groundwork for a follow-on agreement that will address some of the other issues uh, that the ambassadors rightfully pointed out, mi missiles, interference, proxies, and, uh, and, and the like. So I think the plan, as I understand it, in terms of what they've said publicly anyway, is JCPOA first and then follow on agreements to address those other 
uh, uh, issues afterwards. And again, it goes back to the question of, do we really have time? And Ambassador, I say this very, very respectfully and really out of curiosity, do, do we have time for a negotiation with Iran that, enco that encompasses all of those issues and, 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 and sort of changes some fundamental elements of the JCPOA? So you're opening that whole can of worms up again, G given where Iran is on its nuclear program right now and the, and the advancements they've made and the, 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 I think the concerted effort they're gonna to make to increase their leverage as much as they can. Uh, fair question, Frank, but I would argue from a, from a UAE or a regional perspective, people are suffering from Iranian drone attacks, missile attacks, proxy attacks. So they're saying, do we have time to not address those right now at the front end? We're the ones paying these prices today, today. And so I, I again, you know, the perspective from, you know, 7,000 miles away is going to be fundamentally different from the perspective of somebody who's paying the price today. And again, I think we are positioned to be able to both, to do both simultaneously. I worry, I, I don't think anything is wrong with Jake's uh, sequencing of doing the nuclear first and then everything else second. Problem is, why would Iran come back for any subsequent agreement once you've already lifted sanctions, once you've already given them sanctions relief? So that, that's my worry with sequencing is you've driven the car off the lot. There, there's nothing else to do after that. Yeah, no, I understand. So it's a, it's a, it's a thoughtful argument. I think the answer from the Biden administration would be, and again, this was not my file, but I think the answer would be, there's a whole set of other sanctions that relate to those issues that provide us some leverage in that regard. And that we would, we would, we would utilize that uh, as a means of addressing those other issues. But yeah, no, that's, that's obviously the overarching question in that regard. How about an Israel, Ido? I, the one issue that Israel security has establishment seems to be pretty unified as the Iranian threat, but how do you think the Israelis are looking at um, the return to the JCPOA, potentially a political change in, in Israel and this very imminent threat that Iran poses both to the UAE and to the Gulf states and to Israel? Yeah, and um, by the way, it's not just the security establishment, also the Israeli political system from left to right uh, was united in its opposition to the um, so-called Iran deal. And the reason is not, of, of, of course, because, you know, uh, Israelis did not appreciate the efforts of, of the Obama administration. But I think at the, at the core, there is a big philosophical difference. Um, just like uh, the esteemed ambassador pointed out, uh, Israel is more concerned with the underlying motivations of the Iranian <clears throat> regime which are being manifested in way more than just one vector or one arena. You mentioned uh, what they're doing in Syria, what they're doing in southern Lebanon, Hezbollah, destabilizing regimes all over the, the area, including in the Gulf region, in Syria, working with the leadership against the people, in Bahrain, working with the people against the leadership. And um, not to mention Latin America, where you find their fingerprints and footprints all over the place. And so Israel is asking a very simple question. Um, what about the values they stand for? Who is going to address that? And again, uh, our, the experience with the Iranians uh, taught us the hard way that unless there is a presence of very credible uh, military and physical threat combined with a harsh regime of sanctions, uh, they're not going to voluntarily move forward. And we've seen it time and again in the past. The only time they stopped the program voluntarily was when they were convinced that the United States troops are going to attack. Um, and uh, indeed, uh, just as it happened in the early 1990s, I remember that day very, very clearly as a young journalist, I covered that uh, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait on August 2nd of 1990, uh, he changed the divisions in the Middle East, and overnight, Israel found itself on the same on the same side as Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries. Same thing is happening now with the Iranians, largely because of the Iranian deal. The way forward is to talk to the parties, as uh, the ambassador mentioned, bring them to the table, make sure that there is a sufficient degree of transparency and communications, and uh, that really is the essence of true diplomacy. Um, let's talk things over. And I think that uh, once this will be done, uh, a great deal of achievement can, could be achieved. I have a question for, for Jay. Sure. I'm just gonna change it, turn the tables a little bit. What if we go back into JCPOA and it, it is feasible and it makes sense. It's, you know, it, it, it 
sort of puts a stop on kind of the progress right now. What if a bunch of countries from the region came to the United States and said, we want the exact same deal. We want the exact same arrangements. We want enrichment with scrutiny, with monitoring, with everything, but we want the exact same deals the Iranians have. What would the U.S. response be? Well, definitely be, would be no. And that's, I mean, for me, because I, I wrote a book on the Iran deal that the, the problem I always saw with the agreement was you're basically green lighting an industrial scale enrichment program for Iran, which, you know, even if we had safeguards at the, it's still a dual use technology. How are you going to get the Saudis who was already talking about developing enrichment? Uh, the Turks have talked about it. The Egyptians have talked about it. How are you not going to stop? How are you going to stop a nuclear cascade of these type of technologies across the region if Iran is allowed to have, you know, basically an industrial scale enrichment program, which inevitably is a dual use capability. So I still think that's got to be something that's wrestled with. I know your government decided to go for this gold standard of, yes, we can develop a a nuclear program, a nuclear power program, but we're not going to enrich uranium on our shores and that deals work. And that was, that's been offered to the Iranians. I mean, that's even the Bush administration offered that to the Iranians that, you know, if you just keep this as a civilian power program and, you know, you buy your uranium from offshore, we'll support you on that. And, you know, they never did. And I think that's the belief because they want a nuclear bomb. <laughs> um, so I, I would still think in the in the greater scheme of things, you there has to be some solution where countries do have nuclear power, but they're they agree to some role of, of getting it in a way that doesn't give them a military capability. So I think that's probably the answer, whether that's too, you know, maybe if that's too arcane or too sophisticated, I don't know, but I do think that is is probably, you know, part of the answer. Um, Jay, I, would just, I would just point out very, very quickly with respect to the JCPOA that <clears throat> obviously there are very strict limits on how much Iran was able to enrich and, and how much they were able to keep. They're required to uh, uh, remove a lot of the uranium, uranium that they do enrich. So it's not as if uh, uh, the negotiations initially, were blind to that issue. Right. And I think the, 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 the understanding that, that we were operating under was that we would, uh, as time went by, we would look to extend the time frames and extend those limitations and extend right. the inspections regime. So I think it's been a, a little tiny bit of a mischaracterization of this, the notion that the intention from the uh, Obama administration was just to walk away in 12 years time or 10 years time, whenever the various sunsets uh, uh, set in and just say, okay, guys, you know, go right ahead. It, I think the, the, the idea was that was as good of a deal as they thought they could get at that time. And there was an understanding that as we went forward, uh, we would look to extend those time frames and those limitations. So it was never the case that that this deal was intended to allow Iran an unlimited uh, domestic enrichment capability and, and the capacity to create enough uh, nuclear material for a nuclear war. In fact, it was just the opposite. Great. Well, let's turn a bit more to the to the future because we only have about 10 minutes left. I'm curious from Elizabeth's viewpoint, what do you think the Trump administration's hope was as far as the Abraham Accords and where this would go in, you know, as you said, they were hoping for four more years to build this out. Yeah. I, think, I think the key one was Saudi Arabia and there's still some question whether the Saudis are gonna go there, but from from your That's right. talks with the Kushner crowd, what do you think their ambitions were, where this was headed? Uh, I think the, First and foremost, further regional economic integration uh, and, and private sector growth was absolutely um, the goal. And, and again, that it was, as I was saying at the at the top of the um, of the event, the emphasis on this economic package was there was um, a lot of hope placed in that. And so, in a way, there still is this reliance or this hope around um, private sector growth and economic integration as really being the um, uh, the path. And so these Abraham Accords are, are just an, a, a different way to facilitate that. One question, um, I, it was interesting to hear the ambassador, uh, 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 both of you speak about some of the early signs of excitement and the Israeli gold rush and, and some of these promising indicators of, um, uh, of trade and commerce already. 
and I wonder if some of that is sort of the, the excitement of the moment and how lasting and how enduring um, that will be because uh, you know, will it, will this economic integration um, require external facilitation? Will it require um, some funds or some incentivizing? You know, the, the Trump administration also set up this Abraham Fund in the Development Finance Corporation, which formerly the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. So they had this idea, again, like still drawing back to their economic package, that if they can, if they can really facilitate and incentivize this kind of this kind of growth that it would underpin some, some regional stability. So can that happen on its own without, um, without funds or without incentivizing? Will there be regional economic um, meetings and um, might there be even be free trade zone or things like that? Or will that require um, intervention from the US or from other states to try to achieve that, um, that sense of, of strength um, in in private sector growth and stabilization, so that's what I'm. That's what I think they're really hoping for, and that's what I'm interested to see play out. How much can happen organically, um, and how much might might require some intervention. Ambassador Saiba, what do you think? Is this is this um, process now kind of self sustaining? Do you think the Saudis will come in, or will they only come in if the Israelis really do make some? Make either a deal with the Palestinians or at least a major overture. Where, where do you where do you see this going? So I think each country has to make their own calculation, and their calculation depends on public opinion, domestic politics, where you know where the country is, what where they and where they want to go. I mean, for us, it was very clear we wanted to do this, but annexation was going to be a dilemma, and so we traded, we normalized in exchange for no annexation. It was a very simple, straightforward deal. I think not every deal is going to look the same way. And each country has to measure whether they are ready politically, socially, and so on for this move. This is not an easy decision. Like having been dealing with this for the last six months, it takes a lot of courage. It takes, you know, decisive leadership. I don't, I'm not sure, I, I cannot comment on whether countries are ready for that or not. But I do think that we've demonstrated that it can be done, that it can be done successfully. And most importantly for me, it can be done with a huge amount of political support and acceptance from across the world. I mean, look at the US reaction, the European reaction. It's really actually ironic to look at who supported the Abraham Accords and who opposed it. And the opposing list is very small. It's Iran, Turkey, yeah. Qatar, Palestinian Authority. But this was very, very widely, well, widely received. And so I think countries will see that, how they ultimately come up with their deals bilaterally with the Israelis and hopefully with the American assistance. That's ultimately up to them. And I'll just make but one quick point on that, Jay. Sure. I think that the, the, the ambassador and the, and the crown prince in the UAE really engineered a paradigm shift. Uh, it was when we were working on this tissue, the API, uh, uh, that the Saudis had put down. That was the basis upon which normalization negotiations would occur. And now I think after what the Emiratis have done, which uh, as, as, as we've discussed was widely, widely supported and applauded, I think now for other countries, it's a different matrix. They can, they can uh, uh, move ahead with normalization with uh, Israel on the basis of whatever they think their national interests are. Uh, uh, without having to await a deal on the basis of, of the API. What will be interesting to me is whether the Saudis still feel bound to the API because that was their, obviously their initiative uh, originally. And so for them to move ahead on the same basis that the uh, Emiratis did and the Bahrainis and the Moroccans and the, and the Sudanese, I think that would, that may be a little bit more difficult for them just given their historic ties to that uh, approach. But do you, uh, Ambassador, do you think this process could move ahead if the US isn't playing such a central role as it did over the past six months? Me or Ido? First to you. I, I think so. But again, it has to be driven by the country who wants this. I mean, I, I can totally imagine a country, country X, coming to the Biden administration saying, hey, we're, we're ready to do this, but we want to do it with you. And here's, here's how we envision it. And I suspect, and maybe Frank can help here, that the Biden administration, based on the reaction to our deal, will be very enthusiastic. Whether the yeah. Biden administration chases these deals or not, I don't believe they will. But if someone comes to them and says, we're ready, uh, I think they will be very supportive. 
Yeah, they've been very clear about that publicly. As, as I said, I think at the top of the, uh, the discussion, I think the question will be, how does, is there a way to leverage that to advance uh, resolution of the Palestinian issue? And I don't know whether there will be or won't be. I'm sure it'll be a case by case basis, but yeah, there'll absolutely be enthusiasm for it. Uh, the question, I, I don't imagine it will be doing some of the same kind of side deals uh, uh, that the that Trump administration was doing, but I don't know. And I'm not, I'm not sure they've given uh, that particular issue uh, a great deal of thought so far. You know, how, how does Israel see the future of these Abraham Accords? And do you think they can continue this momentum with both potentially a political change in, in Israel, but also a political change here in, in Washington? Uh, so certainly the desire to see this going on forever exists. Uh, however, we do know that diplomacy is a beautiful opportunity to exercise Freudian uh, sublimation, you know, uh, you know, a way to express your, your anger and, and uh, in a legitimate way. And so uh, just to remind our, our listeners that uh, is shortly after the signing of the Oslo Accords, we had a similar wave of normalization with Morocco, with Tunisia, with Qatar, with Oman. Uh, Prime Minister Itzhak Rabin went to Indonesia. I myself went with Itzhak Rabin to Morocco uh, right after the signing of the Oslo Accords on September 13th, 1993. And all of that ended uh, during the Second Intifada. So there's a certain elasticity in diplomacy uh, which allows countries and players and actors to respond um, without uh, you know, breaking all the rules and without burning all the bridges. And uh, who knows, I think that as long as the US-China issue is still waiting to be resolved, as long as the Iranian issue is waiting to be resolved, um, those, I think the larger envelope in which those agreements are functioning and, and developing will be safeguarded. Uh, that's my view. Uh, I can tell you on the Israeli side, it look as when you're looking at the Israeli business community, when you're looking at the Israeli business leadership, as well as the political leadership, I can't even begin to describe the level of excitement and, and enthusiasm. So that's an interesting parallel. How, how do you think, what is the key, do you think, not to have this kind of momentum die like it did after Azo? Is it, is it the fact that the, the business community is so engaged at this stage? Is that different from, from the Oslo experience? Or do you think, no, if it, it could get derailed? For Oslo, the biggest mistake we, we made, the Israelis in Oslo, was um, we overpromised and underdelivered. And when Tzhak Rabin went to the White House and said, that's the end of the war and so on, uh, he should have delivered a different kind of, uh, of message, something more along the lines of blood, sweat, and tears. Um, and, um, and I think that that was a big problem for the Israeli public, because when you look at the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the biggest uh, hurdle facing the Palestinians is that they lost the Israeli public. That's the biggest problem they have. Uh, it's not the Israeli leadership. The Israeli leadership, and especially Netanyahu, uh, have proven their ability to be very, very pragmatic. Um, you know, Netanyahu is announcing annexation, and three weeks later, he's signing normalization agreements. Um, and so um, the Israeli public lost faith in the logic of territorial compromise. That's the biggest obstacle that the Palestinians are facing. Got it. Well, thank you all for taking part in this. We are at time. Ambassadors, I really appreciate you taking your time. Frank and Elizabeth, thank you so much. And um, let's hope the process continues and this integration continues. And thanks so much for taking part.